So, wormholes. Wormholes everywhere. This is one that you guys have probably seen, especially if you follow the physics community online, particularly on Twitter. That's really where I'm at. That's where I've seen it. And you may have been anticipating that I'm going to say something about this, but Quantum Magazine last, I think it was what, Tuesday, Wednesday, wrote this article, published this article called Physicists Create a Holographic Wormhole Using a Quantum Computer. Now, I do believe the title has been slightly modified since then. I think they added the word holographic. I think when it was first released, if I remember correctly, the title was just Physicists Create a Holographic, or Physicists Create a Wormhole Using a Quantum Computer. But this one definitely, um, definitely stirred up, stirred up the physics community and as I figured ripe for a bad science communication episode. Um, now in this one, since this is a reasonably long article and I don't really want this video to be 30 or 40 minutes long, that's not really the point of this series, um, at least not yet, I'm not going to read the whole article. By the way, uh, why don't you guys tell me down in the comments whether you even like it when I do that? I don't know if you, um, if, if it's something that you guys even really want me to do in this series. If you want me to read through the whole the, the whole article, um, point out where I think things are, are wrong or where I think um, ideas are being miscommunicated, or if you would rather me do videos like, like this one's going to be where it's more of just sort of a, an analysis and looking at certain parts of, of, the, um, of the article. But this isn't the only article we're going to look at. There are a, a couple of places, mainly here at the beginning, that I want to look at, but then there's another one that I think does a way better job at um, at communicating what it was that these physicists were really doing in this experiment. So this article starts starts off, and it's really these two first paragraphs that I, I really just don't like. I think they just, they, they give the average reader um, the complete wrong image of, of what this experiment did. So it starts, physicists have purportedly created the first ever wormhole, a kind of tunnel theorized by in 1935 by Albert Einstein and Nathan Rosen that leads from one place to another by passing into an extra dimension of space. The wormhole emerged like a hologram out of quantum bits of information, or qubits, stored in tiny superconducting circuits. By manipulating the qubits, the physicists then sent the information through the wormhole they reported today in the journal Nature. Now, this is not completely wrong. It just paints very much the wrong picture. I, I just don't even like using the word wormhole to describe what was done here because that's really not, not what, what it was done. So I, I'll give my correction to this and then we'll, we'll jump over to the other article and take a look at that. But th this was really just another quantum entanglement experiment. They were capable of entangling two qubits. I think it was just two. Maybe it was more. They were capable of entangling a bunch of qubits and um, were capable of transmitting information through them in a way that mimics how you might be able to send information, I guess you could say, through a, a wormhole or an Einstein-Rosen bridge. Now, they didn't actually make one of those. Um, I don't even know if, if it's settled that we can in fact, make an Einstein-Rosen bridge. They are theoretically possible. Whether or not we can ever make one or use one is not something I think I can, can comment on. I, I, I don't really know about that. But uh, they, these researchers certainly did not make one. They utilized an entanglement experiment with uh, superconducting circuits and um, information being, being transmitted between them via entanglement in a way that mimics, that looks like, how information would, would move through an Einstein-Rosen bridge. And this has allowed us to sort of better probe in certain ways um, quantum gravity. Now, from what I have heard, the mathematics underlying this isn't really anything new, and this experiment isn't really even that profound, um, but it is, th there is certainly some, some meaning behind it. So that's how I understand what these researchers did. And in virtue of that, I don't I just, it's, it's this whole idea that they created a wormhole, um, and we don't really talk about how this is really just a, a, a form of an entanglement experiment. Now, the article, and I'll link this one and another one from phys.org, because I think both of these articles do a really, really good job of actually summarizing what was done in this experiment in a more, I would just say, in a more 
in a more accurate way, in a way that, that better captures that. Um, so just right here in this first paragraph, the equivalent to a wormhole in space-time has been created on a quantum processor. Notice, notice the language there. The equivalent to a wormhole in space-time has been created on a quantum processor. Researchers in the U.S. used an advanced quantum teleportation protocol to open, and quantum teleportation being rooted in entanglement, to open the wormhole and send quantum signals through it. By studying the dynamics of the transmitted quantum information, the team gained insights into gravitational dynamics. The experiment could be further developed to explore quantum gravity or string theory. So right there you re realize, okay, they didn't create a wormhole. They did some in quantum teleportation experiments, quantum entanglement, and created something that's equivalent to it in virtue of how the information moves through the system. Um, so uh, th th this is part of the reason, you know, and I really like to emphasize this because that's part of what the series is about. But th this is part of why, why I, I do this series, because I, I think that when, when there's ideas in science that, not necessarily that they're being communicated in, in, a, in an intentionally poor or, a, or an intentionally misleading way, but when they're just not communicated in the best way, um, I think that people who are interested in science education and science communication, as well as the researchers and the experts themselves, should... Um, should speak up and, and say something and, and correct the record um, in a respectful and, and charitable manner, of course. But at the same time, uh, some, something that, need, that needs to be said, I think, is that the author of the, the, the article, the, the Quantum Magazine article, uh, Natalie, well, I'm, I'm assuming this is Wolkover, I don't, Wolkover, Wolchover, I don't actually know, I'm just going to call her Natalie. Um, I, I, I like Quantum Magazine, and I'm going to keep reading Quantum Magazine, and I re actually really like Natalie's articles, her articles are some of my favorite on the website. Um, and I don't think that this article is just like an absolutely terrible article. I just think that particularly at the beginning, and you know, you gotta kind of, you kind of have to think about this the way that the average person is. They're probably going to read, you know, to somewhere about here. Most people probably aren't going to read this whole article. It is relatively long, and it is a pretty good article. But the beginning part, I don't think... I, the way I would word it is I don't think it meaningfully captures what, what was actually done. But, but setting that aside, since I've already talked about that, um, Natalie herself, as well as I think one of the, the higher up editors for Quantum Magazine, said that all they did was report exactly what the actual researchers who did this experiment said. That they, they, they characterized this experiment in this research the same way that it was parsed to them by those, by those researchers, or so I have something in my eye, um, and so it's like, hey, you know, don't, don't come at us harsh with, you know, how inaccurate you think this is, when we're just saying the way that it was told to us by the very researchers who did it, and that uh, is, seems to be the case, I, obviously, I, I trust that, but, um, there, there's, um, there's two things here that I think are very important. Um, now, I know Natalie has, I believe, a bachelor's degree in physics, and I'm pretty sure has some graduate work, both research and coursework, I believe, in physics, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm not going to sit there and read that. People can go check it out. Um, so she, she's definitely uh, formally educated in physics. I, don't, I can't say anything about any of the other editors at, at Quantum Magazine, I would imagine, because they, this magazine actually does put out really good content 98% of the time. So uh, I would imagine that they're all well-educated. But to me, it's just, don't be afraid to push back on researchers because the minute that researchers would have told me, yeah, we, we created a, a wormhole on, a, on superconducting circuits, I would have been like, yeah, but did you really though? Is that really what you did? And then they'd be like, okay, well, no, we didn't create a wormhole. You know, we just did, did a an advanced entanglement experiment with some some information utilizing superconducting circuits and the information when we studied the dynamics of how it was transmitted was um, analog to an Einstein Rosen bridge but we didn't actually create one of those boom tells you that boom that, that that's where it is so I do think that researchers shouldn't just take what 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 the researchers say I don't think the um the the the, the journalists and the editors should take what the researchers say prima facie and just run with that. Like, try to get a little bit more out of them. Um, 
and then also ensure that you're parsing the information to the laity in a way that they're going to understand it, but that also retains the accuracy of what's being reported on. But at the same time, I don't think all of the blame really can fall to Natalie and the other editors and what have you at Kiwana Magazine. Um, I think that some of the blame, how much I'm going to leave that to you people to figure out, but I do think some of the blame does fall to the researchers for describing it in, well, not the best way. And I think that that's the second part of this whole science communication thing, is it's not just on the, the journalists and the editors to, um, and the writers to make sure that they're getting the correct information and ensuring that the information is being told to them correctly, as well as ensuring that they're parsing that information in, a, in an accurate and meaningful manner to, to, to what is ultimately, in most instances, a lay audience, like with Quantum Magazine. But um, a lot of this comes down to the researchers and the scientists making sure that they're communicating their ideas in their research in much the same way, in a meaningful and accurate way. And I do think, while it might be somewhat difficult, and I can understand why, I do think that there needs to be more of an emphasis on researchers and scientists being able to communicate their ideas in a way that laypersons, that the laity is going to be capable of understanding. But I do also think that there's a sense in which we rely on journalists and writers like Natalie, like Quantum Magazine, to take some of these complex ideas and break them down in a way that we can understand for us. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's kind of something that, that they do, is that they communicate these ideas to, to the average person in a way that they can understand it. But we have to ensure that the researchers are also accurately representing the research that we're doing. So, so it's going to be a two-pronged, a two-pronged, um, um, two, two pronged situation here with respect to proper and um, meaningful science science communication. And that, I think, is going to wrap up this episode. As always, through reason, we progress. Subscribe!